Greetings to all of our guests from the South Central Oregon coast and beyond. My name is Nathan Moses, and I'm the Assistant Director of Events and Engagement at OSU Cascades, our Oregon State University campus in Bend, Oregon, and will be your host for this special event tonight. Tonight's special OSU Marine Studies Initiative event features Oregon State Productions film, Heck at a Bank, Oregon's Hidden Wonder, immediately followed by a live question and, and answer we'll session your host for this uh, with special. a selection of wonderful participants um, for tonight's panel. I'd like to offer a special thanks up to Connect Central Oregon for tonight's production. Before we get started, uh, let's talk a little bit about what audience participation looks like for those of you that haven't engaged with us before. Uh, you're all coming to us via the MSI YouTube channel tonight, uh, but those of you that um, don't have logins for YouTube, we are going to be using Mentimeter as we've been doing the last couple of events. Um, all you're going to be needing to do is visit www.menti.com uh, or don't download the app from your respective app store. And when you get to menti.com, uh, you're going to enter in an event key code for tonight. The number for tonight will be should be up on screen right now, uh, 1535-944. And again, that's 1535-944, and we'll stick that in chat for feedback. But again, after the presentation, um, after the film, we'll be able to open that up for Q&A, and you'll be able to submit questions directly to our panelists. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to kind of get us started tonight uh, with the film, Heck at a Bank, Oregon's Hidden Wonder. Enjoy, and we'll be right back with you with the panelists. Well, my name is Bill Piercy. I've been at OSU since 1960. I was one of the five founding members of the Department of Oceanography back then. And now I guess I'm a professor emeritus in CEOAS, College Earth, Ocean and Atmospheric Sciences. And um, most of my research has been on what we call marine necton, fishes in the ocean, but also squid and shrimp and other things like that. So I've had a really good time here. Great career and uh, a lot of fun. The rugged coastline near Cape Perpetua is known for its spectacular scenery and abundant wildlife. But the landscape that has fascinated scientist Bill Piercy for most of his career lies below the water. 35 miles offshore from Cape Perpetua, there is a deep water bank known as Hecata Bank. You wouldn't see it, you know, just looking out over the, the blue expanse. It's one of the most productive areas on the coast. It's a hot spot for biological productivity. We talk about our successful fisheries in Oregon. Hecata Bank is the place. So it's an extremely productive area because of these two things, unique position and the currents coming from the north during the summertime, accelerating upwelling. So it's a very productive area. Hecata Bank has become one of the most studied features off of the Oregon coast. But that wasn't always the case. In the 1980s, Bill Piercy became one of the first scientists to get an up-close look at the underwater world of this structure. And uh, in 1987 and 88, I was privileged to make some of the first submersible dives off Heck of the Bank. And it was amazing. It was truly amazing. There was a huge concentration of fish, very abundant and high diversity. And rocky pinnacles on top of that bank were just amazing habitats for big, what we call macroinvertebrates. Things like sponges and crinoids and basket stars just blanketed of these rocks. Big things look like that. The submerged structure, Hecata Bank, is unique on the West Coast. It transforms the waters around it, driving biological productivity and making nearby habitats thrive. Its effects are felt 35 miles away on the shore and even deep in the coastal forests. It draws birds and mammals from across the globe to its thriving waters. You're about to learn the science behind what makes Hecata Bank tick. A unique blend of geology, oceanography, and biology that has shaped a natural wonder unlike anything else along Oregon's coast. The productivity of Hecata Bank is driven by its geology. And to understand what makes it so special, you must first learn about the forces that created the uplifted structure of the bank. 
So the, the way the ocean works is you get the coast and the, and the bottom drops off kind of slowly and then it hits the continental shelf break and it just plummets down to the abyss. And the width of that is called the continental shelf. And what heck at a bank does is it, it widens that continental shelf to over double the width. So it kind of sticks out into the, into the ocean from the shore. The offshore area of the Pacific Northwest from Cape Mendocino up to Vancouver Island is a subduction zone. And that essentially means that uh, the Juan de Fuca plate is diving underneath North America. North America is acting like a snow shovel and just peeling all the sediment off the, the incoming plate and, and just kind of, just like a snow shovel, just kind of smushing it into a disorganized pile. It's a, it's a big attractant for rockfish because there are just rocks everywhere. So it's a very popular spot for rockfish that are looking for, uh, for cover. And there's sort of a halo around that of, of the, where the juvenile rockfish live. But it's also, you know, directly abuts big sandy areas where, where flatfish and other sort of sand loving, you know, biota live. And so it's kind of a, it's a very rich area that sort of has it all. Geology is the first key to the puzzle of Hecate Bank's productivity. But another major factor is the oceanography. The way the movement of the currents, upwelling, and waves interact with the physical structures. The first documented mention of the bank came from Bruno Hesita, a Spanish explorer that gave his name to the structure. Hesita Bank, or Hecate Bank, as many fishermen and scientists now call it, was first described by the captain for the noticeable change in the watercolor. This was likely due to the high levels of chlorophyll, which jumpstarts the whole food chain. The color of the ocean is very obvious that this is an area that has more plankton. If you're in a commercial airline flying down the coast, you, you're gonna see it. We fly satellites that can measure the actual chlorophyll, and there's a, a big pool sitting over the bank. It's Hecate Bank and Stonewall Bank. We call that the Hecate Bank Stonewall Complex. And it's that area where you see high amounts of chlorophyll in the water from phytoplankton blooming. Uh, we see a really uh, productive upper ocean where fishermen can go out and catch fish. So it's this, it's this special area. And it's, the reason it is special is because of that underwater topography and the way the currents interact with it. But what's amazing is the amount of structure that's there, both in the vertical, different layers, warm waters, cold waters, productive waters, not so productive. And then further, there's this uh, set of currents that are being swept around the banks, and it's just a, a swirling, active area. So we know a lot about upwelling, how it, the wind blows, and it brings up cold water from below and those nutrients. And what the bank does is it restructures that and it actually enhances that upwelling in that area. So over the bank, we know there's a bigger area of colder water, a bigger area of nutrients, and a bigger place for plankton blooms. As that southward flow comes barreling down the coast, it encounters this obstacle, which is the bank. And Oceanic flows don't like to go over things because the, the water's layered and it, it just takes too much energy or momentum to go over something. So what it does is it goes around the outside and the bank presents that obstacle. Because the bank is wider and the flow goes around it, it actually amplifies the upwelling. So there's more cold water in a bigger area over the bank. And you can see in these satellite images, there's a big cold part over the bank and that cold water's come up from below and it's full of nutrients and it's just the perfect recipe for a phytoplankton bloom and it happens right over the bank there and you can see it spreading out from the coast it goes out 40 50 miles it, and it squirts offshore with all this rich uh, plankton mass so in this image we're using bright reds to indicate where chlorophyll is high with your naked eye from the coast, what you'd see is this green-brown water. 
this sort of soup that's all good stuff. This is the plankton that's at the base of the food web. So that same wide area temperature is covered with plankton. It's a big wide area you can see in the in the bright reds here it swirls around the bank. In fact some of that water gets shot offshore and is providing nutrition or plankton to the offshore communities. And that's the water that's so rich in nutrients that starts the food chain. First with phytoplankton, little plants that need the nutrients and carbon dioxide and they grow and they get bigger and then you have little zooplankton, things like copepods, euphausids, that eat these little plants. And then they're the fodder for bigger things, like little fishes, and uh, like uh, anchovy, for example, and sardine, and little rock fishes, and juvenile fish of all kinds. And those then are eaten by the bigger predators, like salmon, bigger rockfish, uh, mackerel, other species that are common off Hecate Bank. One of the most fascinating effects that Hecate Bank has on the food web is how it interacts with offshore deep ocean species. In these cross-section charts, you can see concentrations of different sizes of fishes near the bank. Because of this interaction, it creates a virtual buffet of forage fishes for predators of all types. So here you can see in the top panel, at low frequency, near the surface, there's uh, forage fishes like anchovies, herring, uh, sand lance that are close to the surface, and they're usually found just offshore of a, he uh, a front, off a heck of a bank. This shows the animals that are smaller, like curly euphausas, little shrimp-like animals that are about an inch or so long, very abundant off the Oregon coast, in offshore waters. And these animals migrate vertically. They go down in the daytime, come up at night. And when this happens, a lot of times they're wafted inshore and they get trapped behind heck of a bank here. They're very, very vulnerable to any kind of predators in here. And besides the euphausas, mctophids or lanternfish are often found in big concentrations right off heck of a bank. The oceanography and the geology of Hecate Bank are the engines that drive the biological productivity and amazing diversity of the region. The bank attracts a wide range of species, which in turn attracts the scientists who study them. Hecate Bank being a rocky, deep water rocky bank that extends up from 500 meters up to 70 meters. It's within the depth range of many important commercial species and non-commercial species of fish and invertebrates along our coast. Again, you kind of have this change of habitat types as you go from the, the middle of the continental shelf up onto the eastern flank of the bank and then over the top of this rugged ridge that forms the, the top of the bank and then down through these boulder and cobble habitats. And as you go from one habitat to the next, you see major shifts in the fish communities. And when you actually look at some of the footage that the uh, remotely operated vehicles and submarines bring in, you see that, that thick green water and you see just thousands of baby rockfish and other uh, organisms there. And one of the things that we discovered working with folks on, on the coast there is that those fish are a really important food source for a lot of predators, including other rockfish and salmon. So when the Chinook salmon come in uh, on their way to the rivers, they are chowing down on those juvenile rockfish. And you can see that if you, you know, go to the cleaning stations and open the stomachs of the fish as they're being cleaned. And so what that means is that that high productivity on the bank is getting transferred all the way up into the coast range. The Chinook are also going south all the way down into California and taking those nutrients that they're picking up off the bank uh, down into the Klamath and the Sacramento and so on. So there's this connectivity that happens within Oregon, but it actually extends all the way down the coast. So the marine birds are a good indicator that there's food available in that area. 
Hecate Bank seems to be, you know, a retention area for productivity and um, relatively high energy transfer up the food chain to marine birds and mammals. And um, there's oftentimes, I think of it as one of those locations that's sort of an oasis where when conditions, you know, it might be a low food production year for the birds and you don't see many birds elsewhere, but they're still in relatively high abundance at um, Hecate Bank. One of the species that I study are short-tailed albatrosses that nest in Japan. And we put tracking devices on those birds in Japan, and we have tracked them all the way over to the Oregon coast and to Hecate Bank. The influence of the bank is beyond the spatial extent of the bank itself. We see not only high bird abundance and diversity over the bank, and toward the outer edges, but also near shore, and then also at times to the south. If I'm looking for birds, I'll go down to Neptune State Park and then look in that near shore. And uh, if we're lucky, we'll see them on the water. And so, of course, what they'll do is, since they're, they feed on forage fish, and it could be juvenile rockfish, herring or sardines, or sand lance, or a suite of species on the, in the buffet. There's something happening on the ocean floor that creates this upwelling and diversity that kickstarts the food web. Birds are here consistently. So to me, it's pretty exciting that you can have these specialists from multiple disciplines zeroing in on special areas. The gardens are fertilized in the ocean by upwelling. So upwelling is one of the characters that's very common for most of the whale species that we study um, that are migratory and take place along the California, Oregon, Washington coasts. Offshore here, the Hecate Banks has been an important area most years for quite a few animals. And we have a bit of evidence that the same animals are returning year after year. So I think when whales find something that works for them, they continue to exploit that. Productivity can be very, very different all around the world. And here off the Oregon coast, we get upwelling that's advective from winds that bring cold, nutrient-rich water to the surface, gets it into the sunlight, and makes it more productive for the whole food chain from phytoplankton up to, to whales. And then you have physical features like the banks, Hecate banks. So those places have special importance because of the assurance of having upwelled water most years. The biological abundance of Hecate Bank draws an array of species and the scientists who study them. But the area also draws fishing fleets that come to harvest a range of species in the waters near the bank, as well as those areas impacted by the productivity the bank creates. We live in a really complex world, and uh, this job is basically the same job it was thousands of years ago using nets, traps, and hooks to catch this great protein for people and bring it back. That simple mission is something that I enjoy. It's, I feel like I could see where I fit into the planet when we're hauling a, a trap full of fish or crab. It's a good feeling. We actually work with a number of local fishermen and that's the spot they go. You know, they sail out of either Newport uh, or the Florence area and they go right to that region because they know it's highly productive. Certainly fish-like structure, right? And that's, uh, that's a big structure, right? I think it's the biggest, one of the biggest structures on the offshore uh, structures on the, the slope in the fishing areas off, uh, off the west coast. Um, there's a long history of fishing around the bank, on the bank. The mix of species that's available to the fleet is maybe more available here than other available to, uh, to the fleet. Because really, for the marketplace, you want to have a mix of species. I look at a marine chart and I usually get excited because I, I associate uh, so many good experiences from the places I see. And, and, and certainly, the, these banks are, are important. They're part of the basis of, of the richness of this part of the coast. On the east side of the bank, there's a, there's a big horseshoe-shaped area fed by the bank and the richness of the bank. And, and if, if the crab are in deep water, 
probably going to find uh, quite a few of them uh, just inside the banks. Uh, on the west side of the banks, there's a, there's a super steep drop off. So there's kind of a, a funneling in, in the depth curve there. So I think uh, sometimes that's the very best part of the coast that I know of to, uh, to find sable fish. Fishermen have long recognized that the banks and the shallow areas that they support around them give them a large area to catch fish. A lot of us that have been treated real well by our industries, I guess feel like we need to either give a little back or protect what's there or fix what isn't somehow and do what we can to uh, work with research part of the equation to make it more sustainable. We've done a lot of uh, collaborative research in this lab, and you realize that first, fishermen know how to catch fish a lot better than scientists do, and they know a lot about the environment and all of the complexities of how our coastal systems work, and so it's uh, really a nice, beneficial uh, relationship when we're able to do that collaborative work. I've worked with uh, UC Santa Cruz, OSU, NOAA, the state of Oregon, and it's something that I like to be involved in. Uh, it's great catching millions of pounds of wonderful wild protein, but I want to also contribute to the, to the knowledge base in, in some small way. And I think it's just important that the fishermen and the coastal community and people in general realize how important and productive this bank is to not only the fishing community, but uh, just to the productivity of the Oregon coastal area in general. While modern fishermen, scientists, birders, and naturalists are drawn to Hecata Bank and the surrounding areas enhanced by its productivity, we also know that the very first humans in the Americas were likely drawn to this same area tens of thousands of years ago. As sea level is lower, and this happens because to make ice the size of Canada, the water budget comes out of the ocean and lowers the world's oceans. But it would have exposed a tremendous amount of coastal landscape that the people that are ancestral to modern Native Americans would have been living out there, undoubtedly in this place that's the highest resource area concentration on Oregon's coast. One idea that's pretty um, popular right now in archeology span in North America is that the first peoples to come into the Americas may have walked and boated their way down the coastline of the Pacific. Now the evidence for that is very difficult to put your hands on because a lot of it is probably offshore. The banks that are out there, Hasita Bank, the Perpetua Stonewall Banks, these are ground fishing areas that are sort of raised rocky promontories out there. During the last glacial period, as sea level was lower, this would have actually been a small mountain range. So it's a chain of mountains that would have run roughly north-south. And on the east side, on the, on the inland side of it, there would have been a large bay and this bay is larger than San Diego Bay and smaller than San Francisco Bay. So it sets up these really unique environmental aspects of Oregon's coast that we really didn't understand that much until we started to get into the data and put all the maps together. And then as we've begun to do more of our work with the Nautilus and other vessels, um, we begin to see into the seafloor and we've recon we're now reconstructing what the river systems are like. We can see actual signatures of river channels and. Piecing together this past environment has been really important, and a place like the Hasita Bank has really been a focus for our work so far. Hecata Bank is now one of the most researched areas on the West Coast. And while there is a lot that we know about how it was created and what drives its productivity, there's still more to learn. And in an era of rapid change that includes ocean acidification, hypoxia, dead zones, and climate change, the data collected over decades on this spot is essential to our understanding of a changing ocean. So one of the reasons we know so much about Hecate Bank is because of 
oceanography at Oregon State University, getting out there in ships, making measurements. And it's absolutely imperative that we keep that set of measurements going. These long-term time series provide some of the most important information we have to look at changes in ocean condition, how that impacts not only these natural resources like marine birds, but also the fisheries too. So the fishing industry, you want to embrace the kind of science that I can give you for planning purposes and nothing else, right? So um, I, I think so. We're um, I think the fishing industry is probably embracing embracing the scientific side probably more than ever. Scientific ecological knowledge and local ecological knowledge are are on an emerging path. But the changing climate is a, is a big concern. You know, the the lowering pH, acidification, the rising temperatures, and associated changes with that. The, you know, we need to adapt to these changes, and uh, I'm certain that 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 the scientific community can help us do that. Well, I think our initial research was kind of pioneer research, I think. And uh, so that is, uh, as I say, very gratifying to see that this is something that we kind of initiated and it's continuing. And quite frankly, I've lost track of everything that's going on there now. It's, uh, it's an area that's sort of bustling with research. Oregon is an ocean state, and we all identify with the ocean. It does you know, amazing things for us, and it absolutely um, stabilizes our, our environment. It provides food, uh, it provides recreation. It does a whole number of things for us. We need to keep that going and, and have that be a healthy marine ecosystem. And by making these measurements, we can see early signs of change. We can also learn areas that uh, are special, and Hecate Bank is definitely a special place. Most of the life on the planet is under that surface. You know, there's incredible diversity. It's huge, but it's finite, and we need to take care of it. It's a great big garden. Right, everybody what uh, an absolutely amazing film and a glimpse into uh, an organ habitat that I'm very appreciative that we have um, we're going to transition now uh, from the film into the question and answer with our panelists tonight and what we're going to do is I'm going to have each of the panelists go through um, starting with Jack Barth uh, to talk a little bit about their role and then also their participation with the film um, and if not necessarily directly on the film, kind of what they're doing right now for the Oregon coastline and, and current roles um, with why they're on the panel tonight. So without further ado, uh, Jack, if you could get us started. Hi, everyone. This is Jack Barth. I'm a professor of oceanography at Oregon State University. I'm actually a physical oceanographer. I study the waves and tides and currents and layers in the ocean and how that affects marine ecosystems. I've had the privilege to work offshore for about 30 years and uh, I've been fascinated by the bank and I've had a chance to uh, do a couple research expeditions to the area, some of which you heard about in the film. So thanks for joining us. All right, Bill, let's go ahead and go you. Okay, hello everybody. My name is Bill Piercy. I'm a retired biological oceanographer from Oregon State University. And my research specialty, I guess you call things that swim in the ocean, <clears throat> like fishes, and uh, both pelagic fishes like salmon, salmonids, and albacore, as well as benthic fishes on the bottom, flounder, and things like that. So that's what I spent most of my career studying. And I had the very fortunate opportunity to make some of the first dives on Hasita Bank, 
way back when. And I was totally, totally amazed at Diamond the Bank because of the high diversity and the abundance and the beauty of the bank. It's really beautiful. It's almost like a tropical reef driving down there. And I thought after that, we have to record this somehow and share this beauty with other people. So that was the impetus for the video that you just saw. And uh, I'm proud to say that uh, I have a lot of cooperation with this. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed the video and, and uh, it's something that will live for a long time. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> All right, David, go ahead. Hello, everybody. Thanks for uh, checking out the film. Uh, my name is David Baker, and I am a, a video producer and science communicator at Oregon State University. And um, because Oregon State has so many strong um, marine programs, I'm becoming more and more uh, focused on marine work. So my job on the film is to try and translate it and boil it down into something that an audience can uh, appreciate. And fortunately, um, we had a lot of great um, researchers who are expert at doing just that, taking these complex um, ecosystems and functions and boiling them down into something that we can all um, understand and appreciate. All right, thank you very much. And uh, Selena, I think you're up next. Hi, everybody. I'm Selena Hapel. I'm the head of the Fisheries and Wildlife Department at Oregon State. And uh, Fisheries and Wildlife uh, is an old department. We were about 85 years in the College of Ag Science. And uh, as department head, I enable a lot of the great science that's being done off the coast here. Uh, we have about 40 faculty and uh, 15 or so of those are based at the coast in the Marine Mammal Institute and the Coastal Oregon Marine Experiment Station. My own work has been in uh, fisheries ecology and I have served on the uh, scientific and uh, statistical committee for the Pacific Fishery Management Council. Um, my research is mostly in endangered species uh, and bycatch reduction for animals like sea turtles. Turtles. <clears throat> Excellent. And then uh, Aaron, we'll have you go up next. Hi, everybody. My name is Aaron Galloway. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Oregon, the Oregon Institute of Marine Biology. So we have a collaboration going here. So University of Oregon partnering with OSU. We're happy to be here as well, um, representing the Southern Oregon coast. And um, I've been an assistant professor here for five years, and I study um, nearshore benthic ecology um, in the ocean. And I specifically focus on trophic relationships. So that's trying to figure out who's eating who and especially at the base of food webs. Um, so we, the, we just heard in the video about plankton and I'm really interested in kind of the phytoplankton and the macroalgae like those kelp forests and how they feed the base of the food chain, the copepods, the sea urchins, abalone. And I've made a lot of my career based on doing scuba diving research in different parts of the world. So it's really fun for me to see this video um, at depths that are beyond where I can normally go scuba diving. But I've been scuba diving from everywhere from the Russian Far East to Alaska to British Columbia to Washington, Oregon, California, and Antarctica. And so I've seen a lot of different interesting things in, that, in, in those dives. And it's just really great to be able to share if, if I can. Um, with you, uh, how those things could fit into the context of what we just saw on the Oregon coast. So that's enough for me, I think. Now, Aaron, that's awesome. And I think everybody would agree that collaboration in higher education uh, is kind of what keeps innovation rolling. So I appreciate you being here tonight. And then uh, last, but certainly not least, uh, Kendall. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kendall Smith. I've been working for the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife for the last couple of years. Um, I work on commercial and recreational shellfish fisheries mostly, so primarily the commercial pink shrimp fishery. Um, and then on the uh, recreational side, the red abalone fishery is a big part of my job. Um, and then I am actually gonna be starting uh, in the fall with Aaron in his lab at U of O at the Oregon Institute of Marine Biology. And I'm gonna be working on a project sort of as a collaboration between the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and U of O looking at how we can conserve and develop a fishery management plan for the recreational red abalone fishery. So 
happy to be here as a student slash fisheries person. And we're happy to have all of you here tonight. So again, thank you so much for your time. Um, what we're going to do is before we kind of get started with some of the questions that are coming in, again, just a reminder, um, those of you that want to put questions in, we've put on the screen a couple times, uh, minty.com and then that event code down at the bottom. We've also put it in the YouTube chat. Um, so feel free to pop questions to us as we go along. Uh, Jack, before we get started with uh, kind of our Q&A panel, anything you want to kind of lead off with, either a kind of conclusion to the film or, or anything you want to kind of start us off with? Sure, I just want to, just like Nathan did, encourage you to ask all sorts of questions. You know, whether you saw something interesting in the science in the film, or you want to know about the area, what it looks like underwater. Um, ask us about where we see things going in the future as climate might change. It's really a wide ranging discussion. And as Aaron pointed out, you know, we're all collaborating on this. We've got physical oceanographers and marine biologists and scientific communicators. So uh, ask us about that, how we, how we do work at sea and solve challenges and find amazing things. And for any of the kids at home too, if you want any tips on how to get into a fantastic uh, marine studies program, uh, you can probably ask any of the folks on the panel tonight. So uh, shoot those questions in. We're gonna get started tonight actually with uh, David kicking it off. And um, I am gonna pull these questions up here real quick. Um, so David, it looked like some of the shots that you all took were done by drones. Um, can you talk about any of the technologies used for the film, if that's sort of the case that they're using drones or not, or like what, what sort of technologies did you use for the production of this? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Drones are becoming more and more um, standard tools uh, now in production. Uh, several years ago, um, they were very rickety and dangerous and you had to lift heavy cameras, but uh, two things are happening is that the technology, the battery technology is getting better and the cameras are getting smaller and that allows drones to be used pretty frequently. Uh, hobbyists do it now as well. It's a little more difficult underwater. The underwater footage is all done with submersibles, um, so you can't really remotely can pilot a drone. You need some sort of tether or cable to do that underwater. But, um, but so some of the submersibles were, um, were worked that way remotely by a, um, by a research on a research ship. And then, of course, some of the older footage underwater was taken from uh, the actual submersible back uh, when Bill did his first dive. So um, we had a combination of technologies over about 30 year period that, that we used to put the film together. Uh, Selena, you've got a hand up there, so I'll let you go. Yeah, ahead and I, I just wanted to add, uh, we use drones in wildlife conservation uh, science a lot these days. Um, and uh, even and for whales, uh, we can even collect whale uh, blow whale snot with uh, drones now to see if they're sick. So it's pretty cool the things you can do with drones. Well, I'm so happy that question came up because I did not know that. That is new information for me. We've we've taken this uh, this presentation a couple different evenings, and we we find something out new every night. So so thank you. Um, all right, let's go on. So actually, Selena, right back to you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the protection of the bank in any of the nearby waters and, and kind of anything that's going on around there? Yeah, so um, the U.S. territorial waters go out to 200 miles beyond our shore, and the state waters go out to three miles. Um, and Hecate Bank is in between those, so it's in federal waters. Uh, for the most part, and uh, the fisheries are uh, governed there by the Pacific Fishery Management Council. And right now the bank is designated as what we call a central fish habitat. And it also has additional uh, protection as an area of conservation concern. So um, basically what that means is it is open to fishing, but not with any sort of uh, the bottom contact gear, the trawls that might actually damage the habitat on the bank. So that's the current protections. Um, we're, uh, of course, there are uh, proposals and things people talk about, maybe additional protections for the bank because it is such an important area. All right, thank you for that. Uh, Bill, yeah, go ahead, Bill. 
I just want to ask Selena what your, your thoughts are on making Hecate Bank a national marine sanctuary, which has nothing to do with the fisheries, but would protect it from oil and gas exploration and things like that. Yeah, so it's uh, so national marine sanctuaries occur on the west coast up in uh, Olympic National Sanctuary and down in the Farallon Islands is the next closest one for us uh, in California. We do not have a national marine sanctuary off the Oregon coast at this time. Um, one thing though, uh, so a marine sanctuary would be a place where, uh, again, there would be certain protections of certain features and so on, but fisheries uh, do occur within national marine sanctuary boundaries and the Pacific Fishery Management Council works with the national uh, marine sanctuary program to determine what fishing practices are, are allowed and what are not allowed. The other thing about designation of a marine sanctuary would be potential federal monies for research, which could be very valuable off the coast here. Awesome. And yeah, Jack, or uh, go ahead. I just wanted to follow right on with what Selena said right there at the end about the importance of, as a research site. And Bill and I have talked about this over the years. On the northern end of the bank, we have a, a line that we go out on the ships, you know, at least quarterly. And we've been doing that for 50, 60 years. And those measurements are what allow us to see change in the ocean. So whether it be the, the currents or the temperature, like I study, or changes in the zooplankton populations or fish. And uh, we have an, a program, Marine Studies Initiative at Oregon State, that's bringing students to look at the ocean and to look at the challenges facing it. And so what we're kind of thinking about is having an area where it is a research site that we can keep going back to both for education and uh, keep an eye on changes. Excellent. All right. Thank you. Uh, the questions are starting to, to come in now, so this is great. Um, we are getting a number around kind of the impact of changing climate and ocean conditions um, that impact the currents, upwelling, and other factors um, that either increase productivity or are hurting productivity of the bank and kind of what your thoughts are on that. Well, I'll take a first cut and then people can chime in. The, the upwelling, as you heard in the film, is, is essential to bringing those nutrients up. And the bank is very special because it's got that added bit of uh, push for the upwelling. And then this retention of material on the bank, it's got sort of a natural incubator. And you know, maybe Aaron will chime in about that, about growth of the base of the food web. So what drives that, of course, are the winds and then the availability of the nutrients. So we, we are seeing some changes in the winds. Um, they're becoming sometimes uh, more permanently blowing from north to south. So Oregon is a place where things flop back and forth. If you've been to the coast, you'll have a couple of good days, uh, sunny weather, winds howling out of the north, super cold ocean temperatures in the summer. And then it'll flip around. It's what we call a wind reversal or a relaxation. And the warm water comes towards shore, things kind of smooth out. And the ecosystem has adapted to that, that changeable environment. But sometimes we're seeing that the waters don't get flushed as easily. And, and so that allows there to be low oxygen events. Sometimes we'll get plankton blooms that can become harmful. And then on a year to year basis, we've seen three or four years in a row, just in the recent past of what's been called the warm blob or these, uh, these warm regimes. And that really has uh, affected the ecosystem. It's cut the, cut the productivity and rippled all the way up through the food chain. Uh, Bill, definitely go ahead. Yeah. Uh, since Hecate Bank is way offshore and has intense up all in it, really a hot spot, or maybe I should have a cold spot. So how much is it different from coastal upwelling, in other words, is it going to be more persistent of a really good spot for upwelling, as opposed to the coastal systems, which may be weaker? Yeah. So what Bill's talking about is, you know, we've got upwelling all along the coast. It's it's fairly wide, but uh, the bank is what makes this big area. And then as the currents swoop around the bank, there's a additional upwelling. So I, I, Bill, in that sense, that that extra, you know 
upwelling out at the bank, it is going to stay there. That's a good thing. I'm a little bit more concerned about the changes in the uh, the layering in the water, where we've got that warm cap of water, and that kind of fights against that upwelling of good cold water and nutrients. Excellent. All right. Um, going through here, and I'm going to pull this one out because these are my favorite questions, Jack. Um, this is from, and I'm going to call his name out because he's a special viewer tonight. Uh, Rick Watts, eight years old. Uh, question from him. Uh, what types of sharks are found around Hecata Bank? I think somebody who's been there should answer that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've been on the surface. I haven't been underneath. Bill or Aaron, you want to take a shot? Or even Ken? Oh, certainly offshore waters have had a bit. You know, the blue sharks are common, probably the most common shark off the Oregon coast. And uh, you have other sharks, probably they're, they're like dogfish sharks and things like that. They're on the bottom. They're very common too. But uh, those are the two species I would say that are probably the most common around or on top of Hesita Bay. <clears throat> sometimes we see salmon sharks at some sometimes of year because they're uh, following the salmon because that's what they eat. They look like little great whites, and I wouldn't say this little. They're more like they're pretty big still, uh, but we do see those fish uh, uh, sometimes when some warm water comes in close to shore too. And uh, yeah, blue sharks. Uh, let's see. I was out fishing couple weeks ago and somebody said they saw a fresher fresher shark which is the one with the really long tail so um, those are mostly down in California but every once in a while we'll see them up here too and one of the coolest things that we see especially when that warm water comes in close to shore are the mola molas the sunfish the ocean sunfish and those are those big fish they got big long fins going each way it looks like a fish that's been chopped in half and we, I was, uh, when I was out, we saw probably half a dozen or so, and one of them was about five feet long. Uh, it was huge. Uh, oh, Bill, hold on real quick. Go ahead, Bill. Oh, just sorry. During El Nino, there are a lot of those southern species that come. Salmon sharks are really farther north, but uh, the blue sharks are around too, but um, we have all kinds of things like bluefin tuna, the yellowfin tuna during El Nino periods that come ashore, and bizarre tropical species too. And I have to say, uh, I love that question because this is my favorite week of the year. It is Shark Week. So uh, that's a personal favorite of mine. Uh, Aaron, I think jumping to you now, um, you talked a little bit about uh, exploits and scuba diving and things such as that. What's some of the coolest things that you've ever seen along the Oregon coast while you've been scuba diving? Yeah, thanks. And I will just chime in on the sharks question really quick. I haven't seen a shark diving on the Oregon coast yet, but um, for our, our, our young friend who asked the question, I would try to get him excited about some of the more lesser known sharks. So one of the things that I saw when we were watching the video just now was a ratfish, um, which you might want to Google that. Um, that's a chimera. So that's a, that's a type of shark. It's not really a shark per se, but it's a cartilaginous organism that's closely related to those. And so um, there was ratfish in that video and they're really weird looking creatures with really cool eyes. So definitely check out ratfish. Um, yeah, the, the strangest things I've, the coolest things I've seen diving on the Oregon coast, I have to say, I've done dives all over the world now, and Oregon is one of my, I think, probably my favorite place to dive, because the weirdest things just seem to happen out here. Uh, uh, last week, actually, I was diving at Titchener Rock in Port Orford, um, and came face to face with a sturgeon, and I'm, I'm not sure which species yet. I have to do a little research. Um, there's two species that it could have been. I, I got a decent look at it, but I need to talk to um, a couple of my colleagues to figure it out. But um, in any case, this was um, definitely over six feet, maybe nine feet long. Um, and it really surprised me. I've never seen a fish so big, um, a non-shark fish diving in my life. I, I've seen sharks that are bigger diving in Hawaii, but uh, that was really crazy. Um, yeah, there's so many cool things on the Oregon coast. Uh, I've One time at the same area in Port Orford a few years ago, I happened to be out when there was a, a settling event of um, literally millions of juvenile Dungeness crab. 
so Dungeness crab that are about the width of your fingernail that had just landed out of the plankton and just covered the bottom everywhere as far as you could see. So many that they landed on top of each other and there were adult crabs eating the babies. So just wild stuff like that happens out here. And um, the more that we go underwater and um, whether it be with our ROV, remote operated vehicle, the submersibles or diving, the more we discover. So it's just, it's a really cool place to get to do research because there's so much to learn out here. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. That's one thing I haven't done yet is, is um, scuba dive off the coast yet. I'm, that's my next adventure. <laughs> I can just say, add really quickly that it's a really interesting place to dive because of the circumstances that we've been talking about. The upwelling brings in really dark, cold water, and it makes for not great diving a lot of, a lot of times of the year. So you have to be willing to deal with uh, poor visibility. But if you're willing to deal with that, the biology is amazing. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, actually, Kendall got one for you. So we'll uh, a little bit of tie into your experience. So we have somebody that's uh, asking asking a question. They are an incoming uh, environmental science major at OSU. So congratulations, welcome. Um, what is the best way to get involved as a student in this type of research? That's a great question. I think um, so. I transferred to U of O when I was a junior, and so I felt like I had to catch up a lot with being you know, behind not knowing everybody. But when I came to OIMB, the first thing I did was I sort of tried to get to know all the professors and what the research that they do is and find out sort of if they had opportunities that you could volunteer in their lab or maybe a side job that they had with a project they were working on um, and just sort of get as many opportunities as you can working on different research projects and different professors. Because that not only can you work with different people and see, you know, how to interact with scientists, but you also get a better feeling for what it is that you want to work on personally. So your research interests. So that's what I would say. And then if, if there are any like clubs that have to do with certain aspects of the research you want to work on, that's a really good way to get involved too. Yeah, I was gonna say just to add to that, Kendall, one thing that um, was not available when I was in college, but a lot of times um, our universities and our colleges have websites with the faculty bios on them to show the research they've been involved with, papers they've written, how, you know, other ways that they've been published. And I think, you know, peruse through that and see that person that you might have in that first year class that you didn't realize that they did research on sharks and that's something you want to be involved with. So uh, definitely say do that as well. Yeah, so just to hit on that one more time is one of the first labs I got involved in um, was Alan Shank's lab. And one of the jobs I got to do was just um, getting, he's do, he did a D Dungeness crab larval experiment. So every day I'd go out and I'd um, collect a water sample. And now in my job, we actually are referring to that work now, like with ODFW. So using it as a recruitment tool for the Dungeness crab fishery. So it's just cool that years ago that I first got involved with that and now my job is involved with it too. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. That is awesome. All right, I'm getting a number of questions around um, current research uh, looking for early human artifacts and other evidence at Hecate Bank. So a couple questions that I've gotten, um, one of which kind of relates to that, you know, what did the bank look like 14,000 years ago specifically? And then what are some other projects or some, some interesting artifacts or anything like that that's been found off of the coast uh, in any current research that's been going on? Uh, we'll go. Selena, go for it. Sorry about that. I muted myself too early. <laughs> oh, I, I actually think that uh, the, the changes and so on, I think Bill would be great to talk about that a little bit. Well, we've had <clears throat> an anthropologist, archaeologist on this pr same program before. It's too bad he's not here now because he didn't answer that. But according to him, at one time, that heck of a bank was actually an island out there and a big estuary around that. And it was probably where Native American people were living for a long period of time, fishing and things like that. And uh, there have been suggestions of artifacts, but as far as I know, there's been no actually authenticated artifact found in deep water around heck of a bank that is uh, suspect of uh, you know, the Native American early, early ancestors. So I'm sorry, I can't be more specific, but Certainly they were there and they inhabit that area, but so far no nuggets have been discovered. Jack, you got something, go ahead and add to that. 
Yeah, I'll just chime in. So uh, Lauren Davis is our uh, local anthropologist that Bill's talking about. And if you think about the present coastline, you know, there is evidence for things that are, you know, a few thousand years old. But if you, you know, you go back to the ice age when sea level was lower, as Bill described, the water goes down, you know, and those banks would emerge as islands. And so now with the water back over and what Lauren's doing is taking large research vessels with those remotely operated vehicles that David talked about and the cameras. And they're actually searching along the edge of the bank because that's where the native peoples would have settled looking for artifacts. So I, it's, you know, it's an exciting research area right now. So stay tuned. I, I bet he's going to find some things. Excellent. All right. Thank you for that so much. A um, couple other questions. Uh, could it be possible that the Hecata Bank attracts sea turtles this far north? Uh, well, there is one species of sea turtle that lives off our coast and eats jellyfish off our coast, and that's the leatherback turtle. And they tend to be pretty far offshore. You're not going to see one from the beach, um, but they do, uh, leatherbacks are able to handle cold water. Um, and so they do come pretty far north. Uh, those are leatherbacks that actually uh, nest and are born way over in Papua New Guinea. Okay, so they come all the way across the Pacific and then they feed in some of these big upwelling zones because they eat jellyfish uh, in uh, Monterey Bay and then all up and down our coastline. Occasionally, we'll see a turtle uh, on the beach in Oregon and that would be a turtle that uh, got a little lost. So uh, olive ridley turtles and loggerhead turtles have occasionally washed up here. They're usually cold stunned, uh, so they've been in cold water for a long time, so they're sort of almost um, uh, comatose. And once in a while, not very often, unfortunately, but once in a while, we get to one fast enough that we can actually rehabilitate it. And the Oregon Coast Aquarium has successfully rehabilitated a couple of uh, sea turtles and sent them down to California. So yeah, we do see them occasionally, but not too often. Excellent. Thank you, Selena. Uh, David, for you, um, might be a personal question, but in your uh, career as a uh, film creator and maker, this particular film, was there anything that you learned about yourself in particular as you went through this journey of this film? Well, I think like most of the people that see the film, um, you know, had no idea that this place existed. Um, so, so I think for me, the revelation was that there was this place that, and, you know, I'd gone to, um, Cape Perpetua quite a bit, uh, over the years, and I had done projects on, um, marbled merlets, which are in an endangered seabird that lives in the old growth forest in that area. And I had no, uh, idea of the connection that this undersea structure, um, had, um, you know, existed and was driving the food web that supplied those uh, those birds and those species. So it was all amazing to me. And I, and I think the other the other thing that struck me is I'd have done some work in Australia in the past, um, and had um, heard stories. Uh, there's an oral tradition in the um, Aboriginal um, cultures in Australia where they actually have in their stories documented sea level rise. So it's very rare that in, a, in an oral culture, it, um, those stories go back that far, but there are people that culturally have seen that sea level rise. So I think it really hit me here is on the other side of the ocean, um, there were people in Oregon that could have witnessed that same thing around that same time. So, um, so that was another fascinating aspect about it to me. So for, for me, it's all of these different synergies, all these disciplines and the different layers that um, that you can peel back on a place like uh, Hecate Bank, and I haven't really encountered a single spot that that did as much as that as this one spot did. That's awesome. Um, and actually, kind of on that same note, so another question that we got is, um, Kendall, this one might be for you. So, 
uh, talking about the production of the bank, how can a bank off the central coast of Oregon have so much influence on the southern coast and intertidal areas? Yeah, so this ties a lot into what Jack was saying earlier about upwelling and the way that it's increased off the side of the bank. Um, and I think that it was also mentioned in the video, there was a commercial crab fisherman that talked about this. There's an area that's just southwest of where the bank is called the, the mud hole. It's actually a shrimp fishery bed. And it's one of the most productive in the entire fishery. And it's directly related to how much upwelling is increased and flowing into that bed. So there's no fishing that actually occurs right there where the bank is, but if you go further south, it influences so many different fisheries and ecosystems. So it's hard to imagine something so far north affecting everything down, you know, to the, you know, south coast and even to California, because that's part of where our fishery operates as well. Um, but it's the same way that, you know, if a butterfly flaps its wings in China, like that sort of concept, like it's just an increased amount of the upwelling that increases the productivity. No, that's awesome. That's that's amazing. Um, one thing, because you talked about some of the different uh, species and that like that impact, um, kind of going back a little bit to the question we talked about earlier with potential impacts of global warming and ocean acidification. Um, with those heightening, um, has there been an abundance of certain species that have increased and some that have decreased that have had impact on on the bank? Is this question for me or is it? This one could be for anybody, so, but feel free to Kindle if you've got something to start with it. Um, I'll let somebody else start off. Maybe Bill or... That's all right, well thinking. Selena, you wanna go for it? Well, I, I would say that we do see more of the California species coming into nearshore waters more often, it seems. So somebody caught a mahi off of Port Orford last year. Uh, <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and what we would expect actually is that some of those species that are, are associated with the shallow water close to shore would um, be you know, kind of gradually working their way up. Now, whether they cause problems for the species that are already there, Hard to say. Sometimes invasive species kind of move in and everybody's kind of, you know, shuffles around and everybody's okay. And other times species come in and they're a real problem. So an example of an invasive species on our coast is the European green crab, which is a, a non-native uh, species that's all up and down the west coast of the U.S. and Canada now. And um, this is a species that does seem to have some negative interactions in our estuaries with, uh, with Dungeness crab. So, you know, it's kind of hard to predict because sometimes those invasive species come in, sometimes they don't. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, we're, it's definitely something that it's really important to keep an eye on and to monitor over time. Uh, the marine reserves on the Oregon coast now have established um, protocols for, for evaluating the species that they see. And that's going to give us that long timeline, plus the information we have on Hecate Bank and other areas uh, to see what's changing over the long term. And uh, excellent. Thank, Selena, thank you. And Bill, go ahead. You got something? Yeah, it's just too bad the Waldo Wakefield not here, because they actually did quantitative repeated surveys at different depths on Hecate Bank for about 30 years. And uh, so they could quantify the numbers of fish pretty much by the transects over this time period. And what they found, according to Waldo, was there was no, no significant difference in either increases or decreases of the com most common species. So it seemed like it was a pretty stable system. And there wasn't any invasive species that came in, for example, during that time period. And it's too bad this research hasn't been continued because every 10 years they did surveys over the same exact spots, you know, in different depths and things like that and look at different assemblages at different depths. So it was a great study, but it just petered out. That's the thing I like to see continued in the future if we can, using ROVs. <clears throat> oh, that's great. Jack, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'll just chime in. There was a question about ocean acidification and, and closely related to that are low oxygen events, something we called hypoxia. As that uh, cold nutrient rich water comes up, it's also um, low pH, so a little, little bit of ocean acidification there. 
and also um, low oxygen. That comes right near shore from the upwelling, and, and usually it's something that the organisms can handle. But occasionally we get these big plankton blooms that fall down to the bottom and they decay and they actually suck the oxygen out of the water. And that happens right near the seafloor. And when we've been down with ROVs, actually Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, those transects Bill was talking about, there's a reef off Cape Perpetua that they visit every year. And when those low oxygen events hit, there's uh, literally no fish to be seen. So the ones that can swim away do, do get away. Um, the invertebrates, the crabs uh, can suffer if they can't get away far enough. So there have been die-offs due to those low oxygen events. But to be honest, what, we're still working on what, you know, what's the quantitative relationship. How much low oxygen leads to how much loss of fishes and invertebrates. It, it gets back to what Aaron was saying, we just don't have enough eyes under the ocean right now. So, you know, if those students out there come help us figure that one out, we've got to link together those changes in the oxygen fields and what's happening to the fisheries. Uh, Selena, go ahead. Yeah, I would just add too that um, one of the things that we can also do is work with the fishermen who, and some of them have been out fishing for 30, 40 years, and they can give us interesting information uh, of their observations over time. So an example was a project that uh, my lab did uh, looking at the Humboldt squid. I don't know if any of you remember the big Humboldt squid invasion, but these big, you know, six foot long squid that suddenly showed up uh, for a couple years off our waters. And we did a lot of surveys talking to people up and down the coast about whether they'd ever seen that or you know wh where they had seen squid before and what their experience was with it. And we took their information plus the information we had from oceanographers and people who were studying, and the scientists who were studying squid, and we combined it and made some maps and other things to predict what were the conditions that were best for Humboldt squid. Uh, that might help us predict the next time that they come around. So it's nice to work with the locals to uh, that thing that Bob Etter uh, com um, commented on at the end of the film about combining scientific knowledge and uh, local knowledge uh, to understand how the system works. Funny, that collaboration word comes back in again, doesn't it, Selena? <laughs> yeah, sure. Awesome. Um, okay, so going back a little bit, we've talked a little bit about uh, kind of the unique structure of Heck in a Bank, um, kind of a two-parter. How actual big, how, how big, deep, wide is the bank? And then are there any structural aspects of Heck in a Bank that make it more prone for uh, hypoxic conditions? That's, that's well above my pay grade for understanding, so, so hopefully uh, you got that one. I'll take a I'll take a first cut. So, um, the way the ocean floor is shaped off Oregon is you start at the coast and it goes slowly down to about 50 meters, 150 feet or so. Then it flattens out, very gently sloping for a while. That's called the continental shelf. It's sort of like looking at the Willamette Valley or something like that. And then about 20 miles out. 30, 35 kilometers, it falls off and down the continental slope. And um, we always plot it up like it's a really sharp thing, but it's about a 7% slope. So the way to think about that is the, if you go up in the Cascades and there's a big sign for trucks that got to get their brakes ready, it always says 7% downhill. So just picture in your mind coming down off the Cascades. In this case, it would go all the way down to full ocean depth, you know, 3,000, 4,000 meters. So that's kind of how things are shaped out there. The, the, uh, the bank itself widens the continental shelf to double the width. So it's, you know, 40, 50 miles offshore at that point. And, uh, you know, maybe Bill can talk to this, but on the outside and southern part, it's super steep really steep and so um, you know that does affect the ocean currents and I think the fisheries in that area and then the last part of that question is is you know is it doing anything special to the hypoxia and it does because 
kind of shoves the currents offshore and keeps them from coming in and flushing out the nearshore waters. So we get a little bit of a stagnation zone inside on the bank. If you leave the water there too long and you have decay of the plankton, that's where we see some of that hypoxia. You know, it's a, it's a terrific place for plankton growth, but if you get a little bit too much of that and don't flush it, you can get low oxygen. Excellent. Uh, Bill, any kind of in additions to that, what, what Jack was talking about? Well, Jack alluded to this, I think. But when you have strong up on it and then it relaxes, then you have a back flush. A lot of that, that really rich, productive water goes inshore in a spot that people from ODF and W used to call Sand Dab City. A lot of sedimentation, things like very rich water. That is where I think hypoxic events may be more pronounced and maybe re as a result of the strong upwelling and relaxation of upwelling in that area. So it's very dynamic. And I uh, also want to mention that something that would be good to look at research is the interaction between some of these inshore areas like Cape Perpetua um, Marine Reserve Area and heck at a bank, because we know some species of rockfish spawn in the wintertime when you have downwelling, and the juveniles they don't spawn, I'm sorry, but they give birth in, in the wintertime, and the juveniles are, are transported inshore and their nurseries inshore. So it would be a great project to look at the interaction, ecological interaction between inshore and offshore in that area off Perpetual and off the Hecata. I'm hearing more research projects. <laughs> um, actually, that, that's a good question that's kind of coming in here too. Um, related to that, what are some, I don't wanna say necessarily barriers, but what are some things that researchers are gonna continue to need to continue? Some of the research continuations like you've just talked about, I mean, Bill mentioned earlier, wishing that some of those other studies had been continued. What are some, I guess, some support that researchers need to make sure those things continue or uh, advance more than they currently are? Aaron, you want to take a shot? Yeah, sure. Well, what, one of the things we need is um, just a commitment by our, you know, by the people, the, the populace of our country to, to kind of prioritize getting more of this information. And so in order to do the research, um, you know, it's, it's just not something that you can do on a shoestring. You can't just pull together a boat and, and get a, a dive crew together or an ROV or these, these oceanographic ships to do these transects, um, they, it, it does cost money. And one thing that we have to do is prioritize, um, you know, making the effort to, to uh, spend that money. And, you know, the money doesn't just go to scientists. It fuels our coastal economy. It supports our towns and um, the, all the students and the community that benefits from that um, booming economy associated with ocean research. So. I think that's the, the main thing is just deciding to prioritize learning um, and prior and kind of maintaining the long term stability of our coastal ecosystems. It takes money. Selena, I like that point you made earlier about working with the, the, the fishing community. You want to say anything about that? Yeah, so a lot of times uh, when we do research, uh, when we get a research grant from National Marine Fisheries Service or NOAA or National Science Foundation, um, we'll actually use some of those funds uh, to hire local fishermen to work with us, uh, to use their boats um, to and crew and so on. Um, and then, you know, we try to, like I said, try to make it uh, a collaborative effort. Um, and so it's got to be something, though, that, that people support, like Aaron's saying. Um, and, and I think it's important for a lot of this for us to make the connections between, like the film does, uh, between sort of that basic science of understanding how that system works, the, the oceanography, uh, the food webs and so on, but also to the coastal economies. So how does that connect us to uh, the ports in Oregon, to the seafood industry, um, to energy production off the coast here? I mean, there's any number of ways that the research benefits um, the, these different economies at the same time that it's teaching us something about the natural world to ensure that we're doing things sustainably. So, 
And uh, kind of on that note too, um, the question that came in, is there any risk of Hecate Bank being overfished since it is such a popular location amongst local fishermen? Well, I can at least speak um, to this a little bit as far as the pink shrimp fishery goes. Um, as just as Selena was mentioning, you know, the sustainability of the fishery is really key and sort of working with the fishermen and the fleet in each fishery is really important to figure out how we can increase that over time. So with the pink shrimp fishery, we've done a lot of collaborative efforts to try and increase that sustainability, not just that, but to decrease the bycatch. So most recently we you know, got a grant um, to sort of provide LED fishing lights because a new re uh, regulation was passed so that we can uh, require all the shrimp fishermen to have at least five LED lights on their net. And that decreases the amount of Yulicon that are caught um, by a significant amount like about 80 or 90%, it's pretty amazing. And so that's one of the ways that, um, you know, that fishery in particular is very sustainable. And I, as far as the biology of the shrimp go, we're able to monitor that year by year. So the overfishing possibility of that is extremely low. Um, I don't know if I can speak to any of the other fisheries. So maybe if Selena wanted to talk about that, that might be. Let me make sure I'm unmuted there. there you so go. the uh, uh, yeah, so the Pacific Fishery Management Council, National Marine Fisheries Service, uh, and uh, works with the states, ODFNW, uh, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, and California Department of Fish and Wildlife, to get the data uh, from the fisheries and to understand uh, what the catches are, what the sizes and ages of the fish are that are being caught. And the monitoring is actually very extensive. The United States actually spends more money on fisheries research um, than pretty much anywhere, uh, most other countries anyway. Um, and so those data go into population assessments that then help us keep track of what's going on with the populations. Uh, there was a time not too long ago when several of our species off the Oregon coast were declared overfished, that they had been fished down to a level that was um, unsustainable. And uh, very strict measures came into place. A uh, buyback uh, program for the vessels uh, was put in place. And, um, the, this, and lots of closed areas up and down the coast. And Hecate Bank was actually in one of those closed areas for a long time. And that combined with good ocean conditions for populations of these species contributed to a rebound of those uh, overfished stocks. And now yellow eye rockfish is the only species off the coast that um, continues to be on what we call a rebuilding plan um, that, uh, and is actually considered uh, overfished. And Bill, uh, did you have any comment on that one too? Because I saw you, you pipe in there too. Oh yeah, I was ready for Selena to come in on that because at one time they were over fish. Yes. And they, as she said, they rebounded in recent years and uh, recovered very nicely. But it's easy to overfish if you don't have regulations and do research on what's happening. Yeah, excellent. And actually on that same note, there's a question, a couple of questions that have come in. And I talked, we talked a little bit about certain things not being protected right now, but are there um, any considerations to I guess, convert the bank into a natural reserve to conserve the ecology, or do you see it kind of staying as is right now? Well, this is uh, the, the push and pull that's always happening with fisheries and uh, with how we manage our marine resources. And uh, can, uh, conversations continue, and there's definitely uh, uh, voices out there that would like to see a no-take marine reserve over an area that has high productivity uh, and importance like the bank. Uh, there are other folks who say the amount of fishing that's actually happening there uh, and the restriction uh, on uh, those destructive types of gears, those gears that might be banging on the bottom or affecting the habitat, things like that, um, are such that the fishing can continue sustainably there. Uh, so those are the kinds of debates that we have. Um, it is in federal waters rather than state waters, so those have to happen at the federal level. And uh, I would encourage you to uh, take a look at what the Pacific Fishery Management Council does and, and how they uh, discuss these things because they do have public comment 
and uh, they and they listen to what the public has to say about it. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, Aaron, this one might be for you. We're getting some technology questions tonight. I don't think we've had a whole lot of technology questions in the past. Um, this one specifically, are there uh, any big advancements in the last 10 years? Because you mentioned earlier about the waters being you know, darker and being able to, to, to go in there and do the research you need to. What sort of technologies have been developed that help scuba divers, maybe in some of the work that you do, um, kind of better take in uh, the areas that they're doing research on? Yeah, um, you cut out for a minute. Or, or, do you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Yep, go ahead. Great. Yeah, there's so much exciting things going on in subtitle um, kind of deep sea and, and even not so deep underwater science um, these days. So a lot of technological advancements. Um, in 2018, I got to do a dive in a submersible that's um, made by OceanGate. I'm not plugging their product or anything, but it, it's kind of, a, there, are one, there are many com companies now that are kind of trying to get into the submersible um, business. And so this is a, a small private company in Everett that had built a four person submersible with a really amazing, uh, you know, full view screen that covered the, the whole front of the submersible. Uh, we got to do some dives in the San Juan Islands. Um, and that's one example. So there's kind of new submersibles and people trying to do more work with submersibles. On the other hand, there's also just really good remote operated vehicles um, that are coming out um, nowadays. So the video that we used to get in the 80s and 90s um, was, you know, it, it was kind of like lower quality and, and there was a lot of argument that maybe ROVs aren't going to cut it. Um, but the ROV um, technology now is, is so impressive. Um, and it ranges from these massive ROVs that are, that are the size of, you know, small trucks um, doing research um, to now um, ROVs the size of, of a briefcase. I have a, a little ROV that <clears throat> I got from a, st um, a startup uh, company that is called a Trident ROV. It's the size of a computer pack basically, and you can just toss it in the water and fly it around um, with, a, with an iPhone. So there's a lot of really cool, exciting advances. And from the perspective of a scuba diver, not much has changed um, in terms of the technology that I use. I mean, there's definitely the ability to do deeper dives with trimix and all kinds of technical stuff, but I just do um, typical scuba, which is self-contained underwater breathing apparatus. So that's just an air tank. Um, and we deal with the things that scuba divers have always had to deal with, with limitations on your bottom time. Um, it's just nice that we have really good lights um, that are quite bright now. Um, we have dry suits that definitely are better now than they used to be uh, 20 years ago. Um, so we're warm and toasty, even if we're in really cold Oregon waters. So yeah, those are a couple of the things. It's a really exciting time to, to be an underwater scientist. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, final questions we get uh, closer here on the end. Um, what are some upcoming projects that the Marine Studies Initiative um, at Oregon State University is currently looking into or exploring? Maybe we can just kind of go around the, around the room zoom here. Uh, one thing we're always paying attention to are, are coastal hazards. So whether that be that sea level rise that we were talking about, or which is you know slowly happening, or or its increased storminess, um, potential for tsunamis from earthquakes. Those are kinds of things we're we're always watching out for. Um, I'm I'm working on a project that where uh, I'm actually using one of those underwater vehicles that Aaron talked about. We're flying them up and down uh, off Oregon, and we're and we we're actually listening for um, tags that have been placed in salmon and in particular sturgeon. So I'm going to share with Aaron some of the some of the places we've heard the sturgeon, and uh, he can go out and dive and see if he see if he sees them. So I, I think the the fun research is as we started out describing the different groups working together the physical oceanographers, the marine biologists, the technical approach to really look at a, a marine ecosystem and keep tap on what's changing. 
Others? David, go for it. Yeah, I, what I'm really excited about is some of our student um, filmmakers who are working in the marine sciences. Um, through the Marine Studies initiatives, uh, Initiative and other programs, we have a student um, in Newport working on um, short films about science. Um, we have a student at the uh, Port Orford Field Station that's working on a short film. And um, I'm really excited by the way that um, students in the sciences are interested in communication and in communicating science. So they're looking to learn uh, cinematic techniques and filmmaking and storytelling techniques. And I'm also excited by the fact that um, students at, uh, who are in the humanities and arts are looking at science as a subject, as a dramatic, compelling subject to tell stories about. So you have this great mix of the arts and sciences happening. And I know there are, um, you know, uh, you might be interested in marine research um, as a student, but you might be more of the um, arts type person uh, rather than the math uh, person. And there are programs that you can go into where that combine both of those things, both at the University of Oregon has some great science communications and, and journalism programs and at Oregon State and, and elsewhere. So that's, that's what's really exciting to me. Well, that's great. And Selena. So I think what's really exciting is some of the new hires that we have um, happening at the coast. So uh, we have a new shark expert. We have a new plastics, marine plastics expert. Uh, the Marine Mammal Institute is expanding and hiring new faculty. Um, and uh, we're also expanding, doing more work in the social sciences. So combining the social sciences with the biological and the physical sciences to really look at some of the big problems that we have, not just on the Oregon coast, but actually in coastal systems worldwide. Uh, one of those uh, real interdisciplinary pr uh, problems that we're trying to work with ODFNW and others on is the issue of crab pots and, and marine mammals, the uh, humpback whales getting uh, tangled in those lines and what are some solutions to those problems. So those kinds of interdisciplinary things I think are really, really exciting and uh, give us an opportunity to work with folks on the coast as well. All right. Well, um, again, each time we do this, I come back with something else that's just either an amazing new fact or just continue pride in the collaborations that you all are doing. So, um, Jack, I think uh, you want to say a couple parting words before we close out for tonight. Sure. I just want to uh, thank you, Nathan, and all your support team and each of the panelists for chiming in. I'm like you, Nathan. I hear new stories and new ideas. and uh, Several of us have mentioned the Marine Studies Initiative. It really is a way to get anybody interested in the ocean and the coasts to come and join us, learn more, and then go back out and help us really preserve this amazing ocean and this amazing place called Hecate Bank. So again, thanks for joining. All right, everybody. Well, again, thank you for uh, coming through this virtual event, this, this virtual experience uh, once again. And uh, again, for all of our viewers, uh, appreciate your time and stay tuned for uh, future virtual events from Oregon State University and their fantastic uh, collaborators. So thank you again and have a wonderful evening.